All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. This will be the final lecture on course content. Uh, we will be looking at some uh, some uh, some somethings by, by Lydia Davis, as you'll see. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but we're moving more and more into a period where genres are undefined. So I don't, I don't know what you would call the things we're going to look at by Lydia Davis. Uh, stories, parables, prose poems, uh, you know, thought experiments, philosophy, I don't know. Um, and then a similarly difficult to define text by Charles Yu, uh, which will be the last text we read in the course, something from this year, or for, actually from last year, sorry, uh, and, uh, and about uh, some of the most notable uh, events of recent times. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this final lecture on contemporary American literature, one that brings us, I think, right into the present. And I would like to um, frame these two texts, uh, or these texts by Davis and by you, by talking about this idea of autofiction. I think there has been no trend in the last five or ten years in American or even in world literature, because it's not something that's limited to the United States, as this idea of autofiction. So we've seen, you know, some of the other trends we've seen over the course of the 21st century. We've seen the new sincerity and the new sincerity's um, effect on other genres. So we saw David Foster Wallace's use of a more personalized form of nonfiction. And then in writers like George Saunders and Jennifer Egan, I think we saw a uh, an interest in combining genres, uh, not so much literary forms as we see with the hybridity of texts like Lydia Davis, but fictional genres. So in, in uh, Saunders, we had sort of magical realism going along with this satirical, somewhat almost science fictional premise. We had straightforward science fiction and the spy thriller in Egan. So I think that that blending of genres, that uh, removal of the barrier between literary fiction and genre fiction is a big um, feature of 21st century literature. And that also happens in David Foster Wallace's fiction and in other fiction by Juno Diaz, though not the story we read. Um, so that's a trend. Um, and now I think I want to, I think auto fiction, that, that blending of genres is still a trend. It was a trend in the early 2000s. I think in the last decade, the trend of auto fiction was, um, was, the, was the major thing in literary publishing. So what is auto fiction? I mean, in a lot of ways, it's just what it sounds like. Well, <laughs> it's not literature about cars. Uh, no, it's it's autobiographical fiction. So the term autofiction was coined actually in 1977 uh, in France by a French writer, Serge Dubrovsky, and he used it to refer to fiction that takes the writer's life as its main subject and blends elements of memoir, essay, and novel. So it's a type of fiction that breaks down boundaries between fiction and autobiography and other types of non-fictional writing like the essay. So if um, if a lot of the new sincerity writing was breaking down, maybe the way to think of it is this. So we talked about realism being the gold standard in fiction in the middle of the 20th century when we started the course in writers like James Baldwin and Philip Roth and Flannery O'Connor. Um, and John Cheever, and it continued to be important. Uh, real, there's there's been writers writing realism of one sort or another, from Raymond Carver to John Updike to Jhumpa Lahiri that we read last week. Um, so realism never went anywhere. Realism never went away, but its centrality as the unquestioned center of American fiction has been challenged more and more in the last 20 and 30 years. And in writers like George Saunders and Jennifer Egan and Juno Diaz and David Foster Wallace, I think realism uh, the boundary between realism and non-realist fiction is breaking down. So you get realism combined with science fiction elements, spy story elements, uh, ghost story elements, and that that had a predecessor in magical realism that we saw in writers like Louise Erdrich. So you have uh, the boundary between realism and non-realism breaking down. Now with autofiction, we have a, a different boundary breaking down, the boundary between realist fiction and just non-fiction, uh, fiction that is not only about the real world, but is about real things, real events, real people.
So auto fiction becomes popular in the 21st century, particularly under the influence first of European writers. And I, I hope I've stressed enough uh, over the course of this semester that American literature is not segregated from world literature, that there's always these influences from elsewhere coming in. Magical realism is a great example. I think I mentioned when we talked about it in the middle of the course, that was uh, that was a form of literature in which American writers were highly influenced and, and credited writers from other parts of the world, particularly Latin America. Uh, I think with autofiction, there's a big European influence. So you have European writers like W.G. Sebald, who is a German writer who lived in England, and Karl Ove Knausgaard, who is a... Um, a um, sorry, uh, a Norwegian writer, I believe. <laughs> I never, I've, I've read, I've read plenty of Zebald. I've had less luck with Kanausgaard. Um, and they both, they're very different writers. They don't uh, have actually much of anything in common, except for the fact that in their works, the boundary between fiction and autobiography and the essay breakdown. So you pick up their books and you're like, what am I reading? Is this an essay? Is this a novel? Is this a memoir? Is this philosophy? Uh, it's all of these things at various points. And um, and it, and uh, and and so there's this this questioning of of genres, and I would say it's now a major or even maybe the dominant movement right now in Anglo American literary fiction, and even in certain forms of nonfiction because the fiction nonfiction distinction is being made irrelevant by auto fiction. So you see this in writers who are whose success has come too early uh, or has come to late for them to be represented in our anthology. Our anthology was, this is the, the uh, what is it, the seventh edition, the eighth edition of the Norton Anthology of American Literature. They update it every five years or so. And so the, this last update was from 2017. And most, and they probably, you know, worked on it for a year or two years before it was published. And so most of the things I'm talking about now only became prominent, you know, around that time or just after. So you have to wait for the next uh, update of this anthology for these writers to be represented, but you have writers like Ben Lerner, Teju Cole, Maggie Nelson, and others who represent this auto-fictional trend. And I think that uh, when I, a work that I think really uh, might have kicked off some of this autofiction trend, it was very prominent and much discussed when it came out about 10 years ago. And now people don't talk about it so much, but I actually think that it was probably more influential than people realized, was a book called Reality Hunger, a Manifesto by a writer named David Shields, who argued in this book that fiction... And he had been a novelist and a, a nonfiction writer of various kinds, memoir and journalism. And he argued in this book that fiction was basically played out, that fiction was kind of boring. It was over. We all know all the tricks of fiction, like, oh, you know, um, <laughs> a, a friend of mine who once who sort of became tired of fiction as she got older once made fun of, uh, of reading a novel and her reaction to the novel she said oh look at you you know there you are you're introducing your characters you're setting up the plot you're trying to in incite my curiosity like oh what will happen next like like uh, she's just she, she just got to a point in her life where she'd read too many novels and she knew all the gestures of fictional stories storytelling and it's just not that interesting and, and you know and I, I don't but necessarily endorse this view though I've had these moods myself um, but it's not it's not a view I endorse uh, theoretically but I could see where you where you would get to that point and Shields got to that point where he said fiction was sort of played out we all we all know the structure and, and gestures of fiction we can all predict how a novel or a short story will go and so we need a new form of writing that's more open to reality and so he suggested and the, and the chaos of reality the randomness of reality rather than these artificial structures like plot and characterization that make reality into these neat little packages. So he says, I just want to quote from this book, randomness, openness to accident and serendipity, spontaneity, artistic risk, emotional urgency and intensity, reader-viewer participation, an overly literal tone as if a reporter reviewing a strange culture, plasticity of form, pointillism, that is like building up your text out of many tiny little details, criticism as autobiography, self-reflexivity, 
that's redundant, self-ethnography, anthropological autobiography, a blurring to the point of invisibility of any distinction between fiction and nonfiction, the lure and blur of the real. One of the smartest ways to write fiction today is to say that you're not, and then to do whatever you very well please. Fiction writers take note, some of the best fiction is now being written as nonfiction. So, uh, that was very uh, exciting. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to make fun. I, I do mean to make fun a little bit. Um, but, but you get the idea that, that fiction, and I think implicit here too, is that any kind of conventional nonfiction, you know, the, if you read enough nonfiction, you also get to see the gestures. If you read like magazine profiles or, you know, reported articles in newspapers, those too have clearly defined structures that you can predict as well as you can predict a conventional novel. So any type of conventional fiction or nonfiction, these things should break down and the barriers between them should break down by creating forms of literature that are more responsive to the accidental qualities of life. So this is um, similar to the, the writers like Saunders or Egan. The idea is that fiction has become a little bit dull and needs to be shaken up by introducing new elements, whether that's elements from genre fiction, uh, from what we, you know, from what was not realistic to elements of reality itself need to be brought into fiction to make it more interesting. So what is the relation between autofiction and the, the other things we've been talking about, postmodernism and the new sincerity? Well, it turns away from postmodern irony because postmodern irony emphasizes, if you remember William H. Gass on the medium of fiction, it emphasizes that the text is only ever just a text and has no access to reality. Uh, so it turns away from that by trying to create a text that does capture the real, that does have access to reality. Um, so it, it's not postmodern in that sense. And it's also not postmodern, uh, you know, postmodernism, if you remember Don DeLillo or, or Thomas Pynchon and their kind of cool, you know, the jokiness of Pynchon, the coolness of DeLillo creates this waning of affect, whereas autofictional texts are often sort of nakedly emotional um, and make this appeal to affect and to feeling. It's different from the new sincerity, though, uh, which also tries to reassert feeling um, in that the new sincerity was very much about creating stories that have a moral. And I think that's why the new, new when I think of new sincerity, I think of, of writers incorporating science fiction and other kinds of genre fiction elements into their writing, because that allows them to create something that's like a parable, a, a story with a moral. Um, and so in that way, it's different from autofiction because autofiction gets away from those kinds of structures, and it also gets away from clearly defined morality. The standard in autofiction is authenticity to experience, not a kind of um, uh, not a kind of sincere moral truth. So this is more what I'm calling the new authenticity. Uh, um, if new sincerity literature has as its goal the creation of moral truth. This has as its goal the creation of experiential truth, emotional truth. And those two things might not go together. You know, um, we've seen that over and over this semester that, you know, <laughs> experience is not always moral. We don't always feel the way we should or behave the way we should according to morality. And so writers who are trying to capture reality might not capture what we should do and should feel, but capture what we, uh, what we do feel and what we actually do. So, and there's also this formal emphasis on fragmentation or excess because life is too messy to be captured in neat linear literary forms. Um, and I don't think I've emphasized that enough yet in this, this particular lecture. There's a formal quality of autofiction that it often refuses any kind of smooth structure. So Carl Ove Knausgaard, the Norwegian autofictionist, <clears throat> he writes a like seven volume autobiography that he wrote very quickly. He would write like a 500 page volume in, you know, in less than a year because he just wanted to, to let his emotions spill out. Kind of like Jack Kerouac. We kind of saw that with the beats. Um, so Knausgaard writes this long uh, work that's just this unspooling of, uh, of emotion and ideas, I guess. I never got more than 100 pages into it. And I didn't like it at all. Uh, sorry, that's just my opinion. Um, 
Zabald, by contrast, who I do uh, like a lot more, Zabald's novels, they tend to be short and they tend to have these structures that are kind of random, accidental. It's always the narrator, you know, is going out on a walk and what he sees and what it makes him think of. And then some of the other writers I mentioned, for instance, Maggie Nelson, who writes what she calls auto theory. So it's not fiction, it's sort of social theory drawn from her own life. Um, in works like Bluets and the Argonauts. So Bluets is B-L-U-E-T-S, which is kind of her study of the color blue. The Argonauts is her memoir of her uh, family, her relationship to a um, her, uh, her partner who's transgender, and then they're having a child together. Um, <clears throat> this, her, her work tends to be fragmentary. She writes in these short little fragments. And we see that in other writers like Jenny Ophill, O-F-F-I-L-L, and others. Um, <clears throat> so the, the point is whether it's this unspooling of endless text, as in Knausgaard, or these tiny little fragments, as in Nelson or, or, uh, or uh, to a certain extent, Zabald, though he doesn't write in like numbered fragments, but it's kind of fragmentary. Nevertheless, the idea is that that's how we experience life, either in these uh, unstoppable flows of experience and feeling or in these tiny little perceptions that add up to something greater. And the subject matter tends to focus on the body and on complex or negative emotion. Um, so the Argonauts by Maggie Nelson, for instance, famously opens with, uh, with a sexual act, which I, I won't describe on this lecture. But uh, you know, you could just uh, open it up on Amazon, read the first little little fragmentary paragraph, and she begins with this um, depiction of herself in the midst of the sexual act. So it's like I'm going to talk about the body. I'm going to talk about what the body experiences. I'm going to talk about what the mind experiences. I'm going to talk about my emotion, whether it's what I should feel or not. So that's autofiction and the new authenticity. Now, like I said, it's hard to sort of convey this to you with the, the anthology because the anthology doesn't really have any strict examples. Um, so I, I gave you these texts by Lydia Davis, which are in the anthology. And the reason I did so is because Lydia Davis is a writer of the prior generation. She was born in 1947. And one of the things I want to suggest is that changes in fashion in literature and what is dominant at any given time sometimes takes the form of generational change. And I think The New Sincerity was a really good example of that. Uh, I think that was very much an assertion of these young writers who, coming up in the 90s who are Generation X, who are very self-conscious of being of a different generation than the old guard. You have the generation of Wallace and Saunders and Egan, I think challenging in certain ways, even as they were also, they took certain things from the generation of Pinchon and, and, and Delilah. But it doesn't always work that neatly. Uh, it's not as if, you know, the year changes and people are like, oh, it's a new generation. It's time for a new literature. One of the things that happens is that writers who are writing in an earlier generation uh, can become prominent later because they catch a, a tone that's now newly appreciated. And I think that that's a good example. Uh, a good example of that is Lydia Davis, who has been writing since the 70s or 80s and has always had a career, but I think only became popular and prominent in the last uh, 10 to 15 years uh, and is now um, considered a major writer. And I think this is her first appearance in the Norton Anthology of American Literature. I think they added her for this edition, which just shows what, uh, you know, th that shows that process of somebody from a prior generation who wasn't quite understood until a new generation's priorities make their work legible. That's the process we're seeing here. So who's Lydia Davis? She was born in 1947 in Northampton, Massachusetts. Her father was a literary critic and her mother a writer. So she, this is, is not somebody who's coming from, uh, from outside the literary world, as we've sometimes seen in this course. Uh, she was educated at Barnard College, married twice, once to the postmodern novelist Paul Oster. So again, she's always had these kind of family connections to the world of literature. 
Oster was a postmodern, well, is he still alive, is a, a novelist uh, who wrote a lot of fiction that was renowned for being these sort of postmodern detective stories in the 1980s um, and was often spoken of in the same breath as DeLillo and Pinchon. I think his reputation has maybe slightly waned, but I don't know. Um, and she has taught at several universities, and she is known for this experimental short writing that is sort of hard to define formally. They're these brief parable-like stories akin to thought experiments or prose poetry. And then the other thing she's known for, which is actually quite separate, is for her translations of classic French literature. So she's done translations of major French novels like uh, Flaubert's Madame Bovary and Proust's Swan's Way. So she has this other, uh, other career. Mm possibly more lucrative not that translators make a lot of money they don't but if you do get a major translation of a work that will be adopted in universities then you can make a lot of money so she probably made a ton of money from her translations of proust and flaubert being assigned in french literature classes uh, in universities so that's uh, not to introduce these crass monetary considerations so that's lydia davis what do they say about her in the anthology they they quote her um, she says, the mystery of what other people are thinking causes the typical Davis narrator to doubt and obsess, especially over relationships. Davis reflects that the only mind you have complete access to is your own. That's the mind you can study and work with and enjoy. Her stories thus sometimes read like autobiography, but it would be more accurate to say that they take readers into the life of the modern mind. So this is the sense in which I think she can be seen as an ancestor of autofiction, uh, like like Proust, whom she translated, Marcel Proust, the French modernist writer who wrote auto, a, a long uh, autobiographical novel. Um, her work centers on this idea that the only mind you have complete access to is your own. So she's working with her own mind, the, the, the authenticity of the mind's processes and that leads her work to sometimes read like autobiography. So the selections they gave in the Norton aren't necessarily, I don't know that they bear this out. The way, there was that long story that I didn't even finish reading. Uh, I think I asked you to read it. Uh, you probably didn't read it either. Um, I don't quite know what that was all about, about the, the person weighing up the contributions to a relationship. And then it ended with that both sad and funny letter to the funeral director about this neologism, this commercial neologism that the funeral parlor had come up with, uh, the cremains, the remains of someone who has been cremated, and the narrator sort of saying that this is uh, inappropriate, that this is uh, this the introduction of this rather silly commercial language into something so uh, solemn as, as the death of the narrator's father, I believe it was, um, is ridiculous. And so it's a story that's both satirical because we've all seen this kind of commercial language, but also there's a sadness, a wistfulness to it as well. And this probably blurs the boundaries of fiction and nonfiction. It feels like a something that really happened. And also she's funny. Uh, Lydia Davis is a funny writer. Um, uh, as befits someone who works in short forms, I think short, you know, jokes are short. Uh, uh, comedy works best uh, when it's when it's brief. Um, so I'm going to focus on the two things in the middle, the two little, very tiny uh, stories or whatever they are, uh, and I just want to read them. So the first one is the outing, an outburst of anger near the road, a refusal to speak on the path, a silence in the pine woods a silence across the old railroad bridge, an attempt to be friendly in the water, a refusal to end the argument on the flat stones, a cry of anger on the steep bank of dirt, a weeping among the bushes. So this is, uh, this is again, this is kind of sad and funny. So we have the title, The Outing, and outing, an outing sounds fun, like where are we going? Um, but then what we have, now notice something. This is not a sentence. This is just a list. There is no verb here. This is just a list. Uh, I've underlined all the nouns. That's all we get is this series of modified nouns, an outburst, a refusal, a silence, a silence, an attempt, a refusal, a cry, a weeping. And what is happening here is that on this outing, 
there's been a fight, a breakdown of the relationship. Um, whatever it is, it's not clear what relationship it is. Um, this could be a couple uh, who's gone on an outing and have gotten into a fight. On the other hand, it could be children. It sounds like it could be a you know, fight between uh, siblings. So it's not clear exactly. There's an enormous amount that's been subtracted here. We don't have enough information about, we don't know the age of these people. We don't know their relationship with each other. We don't know their gender. We don't know how many are involved. It could be, you know, uh, it could be you know, four children fighting, uh, you know, who knows? Um, and, you know, it's sad and it's funny because we have this ruined outing, but also this works the way that jokes work by making us recognize a common experience we've all had and we sort of laugh at this shared trouble of this outing. And so in one way it's not autofiction because there's not enough information to know if it's in any way autobiographical, but what it is is it's a short fragmentary evocation of a common experience that's true to negative aspects of life. So in that sense, it reminds me of some of the values of autofiction. The next one I want to read is Happiest Moment. If you ask her what is a favorite story she has written, she will hesitate for a long time and then say it may be this story that she read in a book once. An English language teacher in China asked his Chinese student to say what was the happiest moment in his life. The student hesitated for a long time. At last he smiled with embarrassment and said that his wife had once gone to Beijing and eaten duck there, and she often told him about it, and he would have to say the happiest moment of his life was her trip and the eating of the duck. So what's, what's funny about this? Uh, the funny thing here is we have two deferrals, two mediations. So the story begins by somebody asking her, the, the writer, what's the favorite story she wrote? And instead of telling about a story she wrote, she tells about a story she read. So her favorite story that she wrote was one she read. And in this story, someone asks some, you know, a person asks another person, what's your happiest moment? And his happiest moment was something that happened to somebody else. And the the final irony though there's an irony that kind of circles back to the beginning which is that it now is a story she has written so she has in fact written the story and it can now be her it, presuming her is lydia davis it can now be her favorite story so it, it's funny in that way there's this deferral of experience through others but I think that what makes this not postmodern irony, uh, there is irony because we don't expect what we're told. You know, if you if you expect if you ask somebody with their happiest moment, you expect it to be something that happened to them, not something that happened to somebody else. If you ask if you ask her her favorite story she wrote, you would expect it to be the story she wrote and not the story she read. But I think the irony doesn't go on forever the way postmodern irony does and make you question all truth. Uh, I think this story is trying to tell us a truth, which is that the best things that happen to us can be things that happen to us through others, can be things that happen to us um, as, we, as we experience the joy of others, as we experience what others have experienced, and then transmit that by writing them down and, and telling other people. So in that way, it feels, it, this almost feels like a new sincerity story. There's this kind of sincere um, almost sentimental moral about the importance of others to our own happiness. But nevertheless, I think that that uh, is conveyed in this fragmentary, uh, very earnestly honest form about experience that recalls autofiction. But, you know, not everything fits into neat categories. So I, I, hope, I've, I hope I've sufficiently conveyed that, that we, we need some categories, but not everything fits into neat ones. Um, and Lydia Davis is, is surely a, a, a strange enough author that she can't be confined to one category. All right, I want to bring us now to our last text, um, the final text of the semester. So this is by Charles Yu. He was 
uh, and I don't, he's not in the Norton anthology. We weren't given a bio because he wasn't in the anthology. I just, uh, honestly, I just worked with Wikipedia and I don't have that much to say about his biography. He was born in 1976. He graduated from the University of California, Berkeley with a major in molecular and cellular biology and a minor in creative writing, then received a law degree from Columbia and worked as a corporate attorney. So this is a person that's uh, kind of polymathic. He's been uh, all over the, the disciplines and the professions from science to the arts to, to the law. He's written several novels in mixed genres, so I think he's an example. Um, and I, I haven't read his novels. I picked this story. Well, I'll explain why I picked this story in a minute. But uh, I haven't read his novels. I just kind of read about them. Uh, he definitely seems to be, though, uh, a writer in the vein of what we were talking about, the breakdown of uh, boundaries between realist fiction and genre fiction. He writes science fiction, he writes realism, and he's written for TV and movies, Yeah, particularly <clears throat> the uh, show Westworld, which I've never seen. Uh, and he lives in Irvine, California. So that's Charles Yu. That's all I, I know about him. I don't know an enormous amount. And I picked this story. So I decided that I would end the semester with something very contemporary, something more contemporary than we could find in the anthology. And I decided to pick something from a document published by the New York Times. So the New York Times Magazine in the summer of 2020 released what they called their Decameron issue. So the Decameron was a collection of short stories written in medieval Italy, in the, uh, I want to say, 14th century in Italy by a writer named Boccaccio. B O C C A C C C B O C C A C C A C I O. I think that's right. And he did the Decameron, D E C A M E R O N, uh, which is a collection of a hundred stories told in the context of a company of people who are fleeing the Black Plague in Florence, Italy. And they flee the city because the city is, uh, you know, everybody's dropping dead of the plague and you can't live there and they don't want to catch the plague. And they retire to this villa outside Florence and they tell each other a hundred stories as they flee from the plague. And when the pandemic uh, struck last year, um, the Decameron was a book that suddenly people became interested in because uh, people were reading a lot of long books to pass the time in quarantine and they were often reading uh, books with the theme of pandemics and epidemics and plagues. And the Decameron is probably the most famous work in, in Western literature on this theme. So the New York Times Magazine in, uh, I think uh, I'm looking at it now, yeah, July of 2020 published their Decameron project in which they invited a bunch of writers, not not just American writers, writers from around the world, to contribute a short story that was somehow themed, had as its theme, the pandemic. And so I read through the collection. I decided I would end with something from this uh, issue. And I also knew I wanted to end on this note of autofiction and the new authenticity. So I, I sort of went in with that in mind as well. And I ended up picking Charles Yu's story as the story that I think what sort of illustrated this trend of autofiction. There are other stories in here that illustrate other trends, including uh, the new sincerity um, and, and other things in postmodernism because the writers are, are from multiple generations and realism and, and science fiction and, and horror. And there's all sorts of stuff in the, the Cameron Project, which I think you can find online. But Yu's story, I think, fits very much into this idea of autofiction. And it also fits into what we were talking about with Jennifer Egan's story, Black Box, because use story or whatever. I mean, it, this this too is it's hard to define. It, it This could be just a, a memoir. It could it feels like prose poetry because of all the repetitions. Um, it's hard to define what this is in terms of genre. But it's fragmentary, it reflects reality, it reflects our contemporary reality, but it also mediates that through technology. So just as Egan's story was tweeted, 
And I think just as Lydia Davis comes really into prominence with stories that feel like they have the length and the ambiguity of social media posts, even though she wrote them long before social, she, she wrote some of them long before social media was a thing. I think you uses this idea of searching of, you know, Google or whatever searching to try to find out what's happening in the world. So the story is arranged as a series of observations on which on what they search for. And it does have a lot of like rueful comedy, uh, you know, of the things that many people experience during the pandemic. So they ask themselves, Zoom, what is it? How to use Zoom? School grades? Do my grades count? They search, they look for patterns, they, gra they gather data, they look for patterns in the data, and then they do something unexpected. They change their own patterns, no more streaming to large boxes, the hubs are empty, the streams are gone, the airborne migration is gone, they stay still in small boxes. They ask themselves, affordable Chromebooks, does Zoom cost money, bored kids, activities for bored kid, Teacher thank yous, teacher appreciation, green onions grow, green onions grow how fast, quadratic formula, sine cosine tangent, how to be hopeful for kids, how to seem hopeful for kids, lockdown how much longer, what to say to kids. So we see this blend of comedy and sadness that I think is a feature of much of the literature of our time. So there's the sort of jokes in here. So I think the joke, one of the jokes is, um, <laughs> does Zoom cost money? Which right away is a, is a fear you might have if you have to use this thing all of a sudden. And then quadratic formula, sine, cosine, tangent. So I think what's being represented here is parents who are now suddenly having to... Uh, you know, be a little bit more responsible for the education of their kids because their kids are taking classes at home, suddenly have to uh, remind themselves of things they haven't learned since school. Uh, you know, like the, I myself, I, I'm sure I know I learned the quadratic formula, but what is it? I don't remember. Um, and so they're sort of Googling these, these elementary things. But also we have these little poignant phrases, how to be hopeful for kids, lockdown, how much longer, this mix of humor, uh, of shared recognition of our common travails in this crisis with these poignant aspects of it. And then the other thing about this story, and this is uh, the thing that I think makes me think of the uh, of Yu's scientific background and his science fiction writing, is that it takes this almost anthropological perspective on human beings, that it refers first of all to human beings as they not we so as if we were being watched by aliens or something um and it defamiliarizes what we do by describing what we do in unfamiliar ways so instead of going you know instead of saying they go from home to work to the store to home that's called streaming to large boxes uh, flying somewhere is called airborne migration, the way you describe it if you were describing birds. So we have this sort of person from Mars perspective on human activity that makes it all the more sort of comical and poignant because we see ourselves from this unfamiliar perspective. So in that way, this combines the new sincerity uh, interest in genre fiction by having this almost alien's eye view of human nature with the autofictional aspect, because obviously Charles Yu is describing, you know, the experience he probably had and that so many of us had during the pandemic. This is also a story that has a new sincere quality of uh, moral didacticism to it. So uh, they realize community is how it spreads. Community is how it is solved. So we're sort of enjoined, injuncted to be communal, to, to sort of, uh, you know, do things for each other, to, uh, to have this new heroism that Jennifer Egan also endorses of not focusing on the self, but on the community. And this didactic posture, I think, is a, a big quality in 21st century literature, especially of the last 10 years, uh, This this these moral injunctions coming from books. And it's interesting to think that, um, I don't know, it's interesting to think that 
that that wasn't so much a feature that even a writer like Flannery O'Connor who wanted you to <laughs> as I said I, I'm willing to be blunt about this who wanted probably you to convert to Christianity nevertheless it didn't write didactic fiction um, and so there's a, a great deal of didacticism in the literature of the 21st century in America and I don't know why that is and I don't know if it's a good thing I think a lot of people think it is a good thing we've outgrown this postmodern cynicism and this and now we're always telling each other be good be good join the community be good uh, do things for your fellow human being and uh, I don't know I don't know if that's the role of art I don't know if that's the role of literature um uh, but maybe, you know, maybe I'm just a bad person. But anyway, let's read on. They will keep going, emerge from their boxes, in boxes, in boxes, into sunlight, cycles resuming. They will transmit messages to each other. Some of them will be confused. Some of them will share food. They will make more and more and more. Some of them will die. Some of them will be hungry. Some of them will be alone. So again, we have this poignant evocation of what will happen, uh, presumably some return to normalcy, but also the costs that will be uh, born along the way. The systems will be the systems. So this story with its anthropological perspective on how we're all, you know, running these programs going from, you know, airborne migration and streaming from box to box. Nonetheless, the thing about human beings, the story seems to suggest, is we can change our systems and make them better. So the systems will be the systems, but some of them may change the systems, rebuild them, make new patterns. They will fly again, collect again in hubs, gather by the thousands and push air at each other, ha ha ha, and other noises they make to each other to signal invisible things. Some things will not change. They will need each other, like each other, miss each other. They will have weaknesses and strengths. They ask themselves harry and megan what now harry and megan what next so that circles back to the beginning of the story where the first things people were searching for were harry and megan essentially what seems like it might just be frivolous celebrity gossip but becomes by the end of the story the moving sign of the normal human relations that we want to return to. But there's also this hope that we will alter our systems, that we uh, will not just go back to what we were before, that this will be a wake up call. Uh, and so in that way, this story takes its place with all the people who have said uh, in positions of public power that we can't just go back to what we were doing before we have to uh well just to use the slogan to build back better and so in that way there's a certain political partisanship to this story which is to be expected um given the the demographics of of, of literary publishing so so that is systems and the way i think it's a very sophisticated work in the way that it uses this anthropological perspective to push beyond this anthropological perspective to suggest that human beings can actually alter their patterns and through community alter our systems um, and in that way it combines elements of the new sincerity and the new authenticity of uh of auto fiction with genre fiction and in that way it's a perfect uh, almost a time capsule perfect piece of 2020 or 2021 contemporary American literature. And that's why I think it's such an appropriate note on which to end, whether we uh, appreciate its didacticism or not. And so that is the end of our course. Uh, we've gone from post uh, post uh, World War II to, to the post pandemic period, uh, from, from crisis to crisis in American life, uh, with literature there to comment upon it all along the way. And I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, uh, I hope I, uh, you enjoyed the literature, if not the crises, and I hope you got something out of this class. Uh, so that's that. Thanks very much and have a great day.